depending where you are. And uh, welcome to the course on endometriosis. My presentation today is going to be on clinical management of the infertile patient with uh, advanced endometriosis. The objectives today is to discuss the impact of surgery on fertility outcome in patients with deeply infiltrating disease or endometrioma. We're going to discuss the complications of surgery with deeply infiltrating disease. And then we're going to discuss the uh, other non-operative approach, non-pharmacological approach. So, uh, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are. And uh, welcome to the course on endometriosis. My presentation today is going to be on clinical management of the infertile patient with uh, advanced endometriosis. The objectives today is to discuss the impact of surgery on fertility outcome in patients with deeply infiltrating disease or endometrioma. We're going to discuss the complications of surgery with deeply infiltrating disease. And then we're going to discuss the uh, other non-operative approach, non-pharmacological approach, uh, such as assisted reproductive technology. Uh, before I go on, my, I have really no disclosures. I, I, I do receive a um, uh, honorarium for giving lectures for Gideon Richter. So as we see on this uh, um, uh, screen, um, the their endometriosis is a complex disease and with a multitude of uh, pathophysiology, uh, such as, for example, metaplastic differentiation of the ovarian silomic epithelium. Uh, we also have the potential for um, stem cells within the endometrium. So if there is retrograde menstruation, but what I do want to to focus on today is uh, both the ovary and the deeply infiltrating endometriosis. So if we see here, there's a lesion on the rectum and uh, there's uh, those arrows are going towards the endometrium. And there's crosstalk between the ectopic lesion and the utopic endometrium. So what this means is, is that although we have focused on the endometrium being responsible for the lesion, uh, we also have to consider that the lesion itself may change the endometrium and have an impact, uh, impact on uh, implantation. So it's very important to understand that even though you may not see any intraperitoneal disease, the retroperitoneal lesion, which we'll talk about, has an influence on the endometrium and potential infertility. Now, let's go first towards um, the surgical approach. So first of all, in surgery, oftentimes we do not have uh, uh, randomized clinical trials to actually show the outcome. So this is a presentation, an article that was uh, 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 published in the Journal of Minimally Invasive Gynecology in 2017, where these authors, Konix, Uzia, Zuppi, and Gomel, um, basically stated that in evidence-based medicine in endometriosis surgery, double-blind randomized clinical trials are not necessarily the standard and consensus opinion of experts is important. However, if we look at this uh, presentation, um, uh, not presentation, but the uh, a letter to the editor, um, so the Johnson and colleagues from the World Endometriosis Society uh, published a consensus on current management of endometriosis in uh, 2013. However, the letter to the editor by those same people that wrote that we should have consensus, they said basically the title is misleading, an opinion paper is not a consensus paper. Now the response from these authors is that it must be stated at the outset that there is no consensus in the literature as what constitutes a consensus paper. Now, although they, they were attempting to show this as a tongue in cheek as to about what consensus is, but it does highlight the point that you must remember that there is a difference between opinion and consensus. And uh, basically, if you agree with my opinion, then it's a consensus. And if you don't agree, well, it's just my opinion. But in endometriosis surgery, there's a lot of opinion and uh, somewhat some consensus, but few randomized clinical. So let us start with a case presentation so, so that um, we can then explore uh, this. 
So this is a 36-year-old woman with a two-year history of infertility and no prior pregnancy that consults you for management. Investigation is normal, including semen analysis and tubal assessment. However, the ultrasound demonstrates a unilateral three centimeter endometrioma and a potential deep endometriosis. Now, just a nuance of terminology. We used to call this deeply infiltrating endometriosis, which is dye, but the trend is to call it just deep endometriosis because it's not clear if it's infiltrating or not. Although I will use the terms interchangeably during my uh, talk. Nonetheless, you have this patient who's infertile, has endometrioma and deep endometriosis. So what kind of management would you recommend? So we're going to explore what the evidence shows so you can make a reasonable uh, recommendation to the patient. So first of all, what do you wish to consider? Well, let's talk about what the pregnancy outcome is after surgery or IVF. Will surgery impact the subsequent IVF outcome if required? In other words, if you perform surgery, then the patient does not get pregnant and she goes on to IVF, is that better or worse? We have to talk about the intraoperative and postoperative complications because this may go into the equation when explaining to the patient that she has options of either surgery or assisted reproductive technology. And then again, we have to talk to the patient about her concerns, her priorities, because endometriosis is rarely um, a unisymptomatic, unisymptom uh, uh, situation. In other words, the patient may be infertile and also have pain and she may want um, a, a treatment that could treat both, or maybe the priority is the pain, or maybe the priority is the infertility. Okay, so what is deep uh, endometriosis? So it used to be called deeply infiltrating endometriosis, but nowadays, again, we're calling it deep endometriosis. So this is defined as nodules extending more than three millimeters between the peritoneum. So for example, in this particular case, this patient has involvement of the uterosacral ligaments, uh, probably of the vagina, the bladder, the ureters for sure. And you see there's a knuckling of the bowel behind. But in fact, uh, the, the tubes and ovaries look pretty well, but this is deep endometriosis. So deep uh, endometriosis or deeply infiltrating endometriosis can be in the bladder, as you see on the left panel. This, the, 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 the second from the left panel has a dilated ureter and the endometriosis in the pelvis is causing a constriction. Again, deep endometriosis. Or in the third from the left panel, there's a lesion on the sigmoid colon and this sigmoid colon can um, have an effect of deeply infiltrating disease, which may require bowel resection. And on the far right, we have rectal cervical disease. The rectum, as you see, is being pulled up behind the part, behind the cervix and obliterating the cul-de-sac. In fact, the tubes and ovaries are normal. And there's one spot uh, on the right side, but it's actually in the center part behind the cervix that we actually have the disease. What does this uh, entail from a point of view of infertility? Really, the tubes and ovaries are completely normal, and therefore we have an obliterated cul-de-sac. So what does this mean from the perspective of treatment? So. The X-ray guideline, there's no question that removing that, that uh, deeply infiltrating disease will reduce endometriosis-associated pain and improve quality of life. But the patient may have just infertility as the priority and not that there is any pain or impaired quality of life from that pain. So let's start with an endometrioma. As you see on this picture, this is a bilateral endometrioma in a patient. Almost invariably, this, these endometriomas are associated with deep disease. So if we see on this picture, I've lifted the right ovary with an, an instrument called an Alice Grasper. There's a suction aerogator cannula, which is pointing to the deeply infiltrating disease, which is under the right ovary. Now, what this means is, is that if patients have pain, it is possible that it is not due to the endometrioma. In fact, many people believe that it is not due to the endometrioma at all, but due to the deeply infiltrating disease below the ovary. Therefore, if you are doing the surgery to um, improve infertility and pain, you must address the deeply infiltrating disease and not just the endometrioma. And this is complex surgery. So 
does an, a presence in an endometrioma intrinsically affect the ovarian reserve? So this is a study whereby on the right panel, the right there's a graph, and you see that the, the, the stars are the controls, which is the highest antimalarian hormone adjusted for age. And then the, the dark circles is the unilateral endometrioma and the square is the bilateral endometrioma. And as you see from the three curves, the lowest level of antimalarian hormone is in that patient with bilateral endometriomas, less so for the unilateral and then of course normal for um, uh, controls without endometriomas and it decreases with time, with age. So how does this, the presence of endometrioma impact ovarian reserve? So if you look at the left panel, we do know within the cyst is in a, it creates a inflammatory environment with cytokines, chemokines, et cetera, which will impact the, um, the uh, ovarian reserve. Furthermore, in an endometrioma, we have a fibrotic layer, which is attached to the cortex. And that itself, is um, uh, attached to where most of the follicles are located. So if we look at spontaneous pregnancy after an endometrioma removal, in the Cochrane database of 2008, two randomized clinical trials, and they found that excision of a cyst is associated with reduced rate of occurrence, reduced symptom recurrence, and increased spontaneous pregnancy rates from an odds ratio of 5.1. In this trial in the middle, from Paolo Vercellini, where he looked at the um, meta-analysis uh, and he found 14 uncontrolled studies, big in size, and the chance of pregnancies after surgery for endometrioma ranges between 30 and 67% with an overall weighted mean of 50%. Now, because we can predict an endometrioma from an ultrasound, this means that if you identify an endometrioma, the number needed to treat to, when you remove that endometrioma is four. You, know, you get at least one pregnancy for every four times, four patients that you operate for the endometrioma. And as you see on the far right panel, the pregnancy rate is actually quite high uh, at a weighted time, uh, mean of 50% based on those trials. So it seems like excision of an endometrioma has an excellent probability of a pregnancy, although we have to look at the specific circumstances. So the first thing we need to consider that uh, uh, on the other side, as we explain to the patient, when we remove the endometrioma, as you see on the left cartoon, the endometrioma is firmly adherent to the cortex with, I'm sorry, uh, with um, firmly adherent to the cortex from the fibrotic layer. On the right panel, you see the fibrotic listening area. When you pull on that endometrioma, some of the cortex may come with it, especially with very big endometriomas. And therefore, you can remove cortex, which has follicles. So if we look at this study on the left, which we published a few years ago, we found that when you remove an endometrioma, looking at one month and then six months, you have a decrease in the um, uh, antimalarian hormone, reflecting that we have decreased ovarian reserve, although maybe temporarily, because of our surgery. If we look at the pelvic peritoneal endometriosis removal, which is the middle group of NF29. In fact, there was no decrease in antimalarian hormone. And certainly for those, we did a laparoscopy with no endometriosis. There was no decrease either. So they double control. We know that the surgery itself will decrease antimalarian hormone. Now, when we look at doing surgery for, for this, we see over here that uh, someone removes the cyst. You see that there are adhesions and therefore we always start with lysis of adhesions. Invariably, the cyst will rupture, as you see here, and then we start the dissection. And this is the most complicated part of removing an endometrioma. If you look at the left panel, the cyst is firmly adherent to the blood vessels which come in through the hilum. So on the right side, when we remove the cyst and pull, the bleeding can occur at the hilum, and that, when we use electrosurgery, can also damage the ovary. So as you see here, fibrotic layer firmly attached to the cortex. And as we pull, we know that there is bleeding at the very hilum, and therefore we can use judicious use of electrosurgery, but that may in itself compromise the ovary. So the techniques to minimize the damage 
we can uh, we can use vasopressin, which is often not uh, available in many countries. Uh, we we dilute it and we and we inject it under the cortex, and that will decrease bleeding. Now, if you if you look at um, vasopressin, there's uh, there's no change in FSH or anti follicle um, count or effect on ovarian reserve in some some places where they use this. So again, can we decrease the damage to the ovary by using this technique of using vasopressin? Furthermore, with the other techniques for using uh, the, uh, decreasing damage to the ovary, we can use a topical hemostatic agent rather than electrosurgery, uh, um, which can, uh, again, control the bleeding. As you see on the right panel, I've used a, a flow seal. Or you can use a three-stage procedure where you drain it, put the patients on uh, agonist, and then vaporize it. And the ovarian reserve um, is less diminished, but there is a higher recurrence rate so then again, I, I personally do not recommend it. Now, sometimes we don't have to remove the endometrioma for small endometriomas, rather than excising it, we can use plasma energy, as you see on the right, and this is associated with less ovarian damage than uh, if someone uses an excision technique. So the electrosurgical approach, as you see here, a bipolar electrosurgery, the capsule of the endometrioma is three millimeters and some bipolar can penetrate up to 10 millimeters, and this may de destroy some of the follicles which are in the cortex underneath the, the fibrotic layer. For this lesion, there are several studies that shows that if you use suture, that is just put a stitch in, as you see in the upper panel, uh, uh, upper left over here, you see a stitch will have less damage or, or a hemostatic agent but certainly both techniques less damaged than using bipolar electrosurgery. Now, I've told you that if you remove the cyst, you will have high pregnancy rate, decreased recurrence. But if you remove the cyst, you may cause damage to the ovary, but you can use techniques to decrease it. If the patient is not yet pregnant and she goes on to IVF, do you think that removing the cyst will improve or not improve the IVF outcome? In fact, there is no difference in clinical pregnancy rate at all. However, if you don't use proper technique, you can decrease the rating reserve and you get fewer uh, oocytes in that patient. So there is no value for removing the cyst solely than to move on to assisted reproductive technology. So if we move on now to uh, deeply infiltrating diseases and MRI, and you see that there is a lesion between the rectum and the back of the cervix that is attached to the peritoneum. Again, the lesion is easily seen here with infiltration of fat into the lesion, and but a rectal vaginal septum, which is completely normal, meaning I can surgically get underneath it. So if we look at how we manage deeply infiltrating endometriosis of the colorectal uh, surgeon, we published this opinion paper a few years ago. And basically what we decided, decided that if the patient has a lot of pain and there's involvement of the inner muscularis layer or deeper, like the submucosa, then we would have to resect. If instead, it's just the outer muscularis layer and there's a unique nodule, we can uh, consider uh, uh, either a shaving, which I'll show you, which is just a dissect out, or just a nodule resection. If instead the patient has minimal pain, we can, um, we can consider surgery if the lesion increases, but medical treatment, usually the progestin, is fine. However, we cannot use medical treatment because all medical treatment for endometriosis it suppresses ovulation. And therefore, medical treatment can only be used for those that are not interested in immediate fertility. Future fertility, fine, but not immediate fertility. So there is no option, there is no medication at this moment, including the um, progestins, the uh, selective progesterone modulators, the new antagonists, they cannot be used in, what, in a woman that wants to get pregnant because they all suppress ovulation. So what is shaving? This is a nodule that uh, we, we took off the back, as you see in the rectal cervical area, it was attached to this area. I see I dissected the left ureter, and this is the lesion in the cul-de-sac and ready to be excised. 
as you see here, the nodule is here and the cul-de-sac is reestablished. But again, we can get underneath the lesion very easily. This is how you do a disc resection. The nodule is small and we can remove it and then suture it, as you see here, and the patient uh, will do well and you see both your ears. If, however, you have multiple nodules, very big nodules, circumferentially, then we do a bowel resection and this is a laparoscopic bowel resection. As you see here, we have removed multiple nodules, including cecum and appendiceal. So under these circumstances, then we have to remove the bowel. Now, the question really is, what's the uh, pregnancy rate after radical surgery? Oh, and, and, and remember, we have to choose those studies where the patient is infertile to start with. So again, in this study published by um, uh, Somaliana's group and Paolo Bertolini's group, they also um, took a lot of, um, of different studies and the overall weighted mean for pregnancy rate is between 20 and 30%. If you do surgery, this is what you're going to get, 20 to 30 percent. Now, this this is a, a weighted mean. Um, this is a study with um, rectal sigmoid endometriosis, uh, but the problem is it, it's it's a very variable type of disease. We don't have detail of what the pelvis looks like at the end. So this is just taking all studies. So. We do have uh, something called an endometriosis fertility index, which we try to establish what is the probability of pregnancy after we do surgery. So, so for example, if you look on the left panel, the upper one, extensive adhesions can barely see the ovary and tube. We know that this patient will not get pregnant spontaneously because of recurrence of disease of adhesions specifically. She will move on to IVF. The lower panel said, as you see here, the tubes and ovaries are in fact normal even before we start the case. And we, we have an obliterated cul-de-sac to this patient after surgery, we'll have a high probability of pregnancy. Now, what we do look for is this, uh, if you, you can look at it and say, okay, this is my gestalt, this is how it's gonna be, but you can actually calculate it. And there are three parts to this prediction model of what the pregnancy rate is after surgery. So first of all, we look at the fallopian tube. This is on the upper part, I can't, barely, I can't even see it. And again, it's at the end of the surgery, there may be adhesions, no fimbria. So the bottom one, I know that the tube is normally uh, as normal as is the ovary. So this patient then will have uh, uh, a uh, numerical number of four, fimbria would be four and the ovary will be four. However, if instead um, the, the um, and we look at this and at the upper one, and we say that it's a two or a one, then obviously um, this is a least. So what you do is the lower score from the, you take the lower score, um, calculate this, you take the lower score from the left side, lower score from the right side. In other words, um, if you have a fallopian tube, which is a four, but there's no fimbria or uh, and an ovary is fine, then you, you still you use the one which is the least score. So together, the lo lower score from the left side and the lower score from the right side. So if this one uh, on the patient here, it's basically a four and a four, which is an eight. So you're starting with that already. If instead the tubes at the end of surgery is, is, uh, not ab is abnormal, then again, you're starting with a zero or one. Then you take some factors such as in this patient, the age of the patient is young, and therefore she gets two points. Infertility less than three years, two points if she had a previous pregnancy, which is not, then a zero. So then you take the least function, like let us say over here, this patient has a four and a four, which is an, an eight, which is the highest score, because everything looks normal to start with, they get a three points. The EFS score over here is a literary cold sac, so there are two uh, scores, if endometriosis one, which could be a one, uh, if it's less than 16, let's say it's a zero and a zero, then what we have is a three, zero, zero here, which is two because she's uh, um, uh, less than 35 and less than two years. So we're looking at a seven, and as you look over here, you look at the score and we can see in 36 months, she has a 60% pregnancy. Now, if you look at this, 
um, uh, study from uh, in the British Journal, they looked at a variety of things, and again, you have a 69% pregnancy rate or 55% pregnancy rate if you have a high score. Or you can just look at it and say, this one will never get pregnant. So if you look at the experience of the surgeon, so this is um, uh, a study that was published uh, by Horace Roman, and they looked at post-op pregnancy rate in 36 patients. And immediately he sent 16 to, to assist reproductive technology, which means that he saw at the end of the surgery that the pelvis still looked poor, therefore sent them to immediately to assist the reproductive technology and most got pregnant. However, at the end of the case, he saw that 20 felt that he, they, they, they had a, a pelvis which looked fine for pregnancy and you see 17 got pregnant. Now, in the middle are those that wasn't sure, but the point of this is that if you look at the end of the case and it's fine, they will get pregnant. If it's fine, send them to art. And what's important is you can use the scale, which I've showed you, or you can just look and say, okay, I can see that this is never going to happen. This is also from a Finnish study, and it was the same thing. They looked at a large number of patients that were operated on and others that were not operated on. And again, they did this just from visualization. And as you see, the cumulative pregnancy rates, whether they're operated or not, um, and this is with rectal vaginal resection uh, or, or, or not, then you see it's all the same. So in patients that were treated conservatively, that is with uh, assisted reproductive technology or surgery, um, the pregnancy rate is uh, superimposed. And there are many other studies which I won't go into about what is the determining factor for outcome after surgery. And you see the older age and actual at home, which is low, will decrease the pregnancy rate. But what's important is the associated pathology. So older age, adenomyosis, low anterior in hormone, that is all associated with a poor prognosis from surgery. Now, if you look at the study, um, first line assisted reproductive uh, technology can be very successful even if you live with a bowel and endometriosis, and you see if you have good prognosis, high antelated hormone, um, mean age of 32, these patients actually get pregnant a lot before IVF. But uh, again, after four uh, art cycles, 64% pregnancy rate. So in other words, you do have a good pregnancy rate after a few art cycles comparable to surgery. However, um, if you look at pregnancy rates in patients with that do IVF, and you're looking at um, what's the responsible problem with IVF for outcome, is it active disease or is it some other factor? Well, it turns out that in fact, active disease is going to decrease your IVF pregnancy rate. And in this study that was published in Quotuity Serology, what they looked at is frozen bond cycles with uh, with um, euploid frozen embryos because they did PGT on all of them. And there were no differences in clinical pregnancy rates, pregnant loss, live birth rate in those with extensive endometriosis compared to controls. So endometriosis patients have euploid rates similar to those with male factor infertility. And what, what they found is the pregnancy rates in frozen thought cycles was the same whether you had end or not. But in frozen thought cycles, there were program cycles, so they were all on uh, medical therapy. And what it is, the conclusion was that endometriosis alters natural conception rates and uh, fresh uh, IVF cycle outcome. But in frozen bond cycles, it's the same because of the program cycle, which they used in this uh, estrogen and progesterone. So the moral of the story, if you want to do IVF in endometriosis patients, is to do a freeze-all cycle and transfer on a frozen bond. Now, now we have to now take into consideration the last few things is the complications. In fact, there, if you have deep endometriosis and you do bowel resection, you will see that your uh, complication rate is 9.3%. If you don't do bowel surgery, it's 1.5%. It's certainly uh, significant. So again, we have uh, minor problems as bladder dysfunction, et cetera, but there are major uh, post-op complications that we should consider and tell the patient if you're going to do surgery. And if you're doing it for pain, the patient may say, I accept this. If you're doing it for infertility, she may say, well, let's just do IVF. If we look at a meta-analysis 
4,000 patients began and we'll look at the average rate of surgery of floor recurrence was, was 15%. So not only do we have a potential for complications, but we also have a potential for recurrent disease. And this has to be explained to the patient. Now, IVF will not influence one way or the other the recurrence rate. So if we look at this, we need to make a decision with our patient. And we need to ask what are her priorities. Pain, pain is almost always a very important decisive factor. factor. If she has no pain, pain IVF. If she has pain, pain she may lean towards surgery. So we wish to concede, and of course, strong fear of complications. You would explain to her she may have a fistula. Fertility is important, but not for all women. And so therefore, in the end, we have shared decision making, which requires exploration of treatment goals, training other healthcare providers, and better information. So if we look at um, leucocyte vitrification and these patients, what they find is, is that if you're going to say, okay, let us just offer preventative medicine. The patient comes to see you, not trying to get pregnant, but you know, like uh, what are the risks for me to be infertile? Um, basically, the if you look at the outcome, this is on a colobus, the younger one a group of women aged less than 35, blue site survival, implantation, pregnancy, and high birth rate were statistically significantly lower for group of endometriosis patients than elective fertility preservation. And in fact, in this study, a total of 218 patients failed to become pregnant from using all their vitrified blue sites. So in, in patients then with endometriosis, even if you look at uh, those with surgery or no surgery, we have um, a definitely a, um, uh, and if you stratify them for, for this for oocytes, fly birth rate, you see that if over 35, they, they decrease dramatically clinical live birth rate per patient. The number of made phase two oocytes also decreases um, and so on. So, the, the most important thing is that if you're offering fertility preservation in our patient, in case you want to postpone, there's, there, then you have to understand that uh, many patients in this cohort of patients did not get pregnant. And therefore, you need to explain that to the patient when she freezes these eggs. The number needed to treat. And so if you look at endometriosis patient, uh, if, if you look at getting a pregnancy rate, you're looking at, if you're looking at a 69% pregnancy rate, you need 15 oocytes. If instead, if you have patients that are over 35 um, with, with elective or endometriosis, again, it drops. So again, if you're doing IVF in patients with endometriosis for purposes of fertility preservation to get a reasonable pregnancy rate, you need a lot of eggs. And therefore, this has to be taken into account when explaining to the patient. So this was um, my um, opinion that if you have patients with um, bilateral endometriomas uh, or surgery, you can proceed to fertility preservation immediately. However, if you have um, uh, a, a patient without those risk factors, we would look at very reserved. If it's low, then we would do fertility preservation. But if it's normal, we may consider just observing the patient rather than um, than proceeding because, because again, these, these patients, patients will get pregnant spontaneously on their own with higher probability. This is a different analysis, uh, basically saying somewhat the opposite. They're saying if you have a low age, you should you should freeze. But the concept here of uh, attempt spontaneous or IVF uh, immediate conception, you know, the patient uh, may not be ready socially to proceed to having a uh, a pregnancy, and therefore, and therefore we should consider this for fertility preservation rather than saying to the patient, please get pregnant. So in the end, in this patient, what we need to do is a shared and informed decision. We talked about pain and infertility. We talked about age and semen quality, use of donor sperm, normal uh, or total function. We need to talk about what about the ovarian reserve? Does she have adenomyosis? Does she have previous surgery? All this goes into consideration whether we operate, whether we freeze eggs for fertility preservation, or we move on immediately to in vitro fertilization. These are the references.
Uh, for, uh, for those, those that are interested in knowing where I practice, practice sometimes, this is my hospital in London, London which is right across the street from the Buckingham Palace. Palace. So, so therefore, um, I, wish I wish to thank uh, everyone uh, for, for attending, and uh, uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, the talk, and, and I will turn this back, back to the um, conference. conference.